volunteers gather to help the unemployed. What would you like, honey? Would you like some onion? We get anywhere from 100 to 130 families that are struggling every week. They're on Centrelink. They might be, you know, uh, just struggling to pay the electricity, pay the rent. In the land of plenty, many Australians can't afford to feed themselves. I usually just get paid on a Wednesday or a Thursday and by that night the next morning's gone. It's a national problem and it's getting worse. To be on long-term social security, you know, it's, it's very, very difficult, you know, very much living in poverty. The hand-to-mouth existence of life on the dole. Welcome to Four Corners. Despite a massive recent economic boom, there are five unemployed people for every vacant job in Australia today. To keep perspective, we've got an unemployment rate that remains the envy of the Western world, but there are still half a million people looking for full-time work. They're entitled to a dole payment called New Start, and more than 75% of those on New Start are single, and the government expects them to live on $35 a day unless they have children. Interesting challenge. There's almost universal community agreement that New Start for single people is simply inadequate, even though both sides of politics have argued that it doesn't need to be increased. ACOS, the umbrella organisation representing hundreds of welfare agencies, has today launched a report revealing that they're under enormous strain and unable to meet the desperate and growing demand for help. To get a sense of life on New Start, Jeff Thompson spent time with five people willing to share their very personal stories of living on the brink, along with those who helped them to survive. Its last light at Kingswood Railway Station in Sydney's western suburbs. Commuters are returning home from work. But not everyone here is walking to the car park to collect their vehicles. Some have come for the only hot meal they'll get all week. Let's all bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this food. We ask your blessing to our bodies and we thank you for the company that's here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Jeffrey. Would you like some of this, mate? Okay, kids, you're right. Remember, small portions for the kids, guys. For Pastor Marty Beckett, there's nothing unusual about dinner in a car park. People say to us, why are you in the car park? And uh, why don't you go into a church building or go into a, a hall or whatever? Well, this is where people are, you know? Like, this is where you meet them. And uh, they walk past and they see you and they go, hey, what's going on? And you get to share with them what's going on. It's here Marty's charity, Christ Mission Possible, finds people surviving without enough shelter or food. <laughs> you find out what's happening with them, you can offer help. If we're hiding in a building somewhere, how are you going to help them? So, yeah, it's good. I love it. Do you want some sausage? The Thursday night car park dinners have their fair share of regulars. Old age and disability pensioners and some single mums come here to enjoy food donated by local restaurants. For others, it's just a welcome diversion from the loneliness at home. <laughs> Many different types of people. It can be people who are on the pension, people who are just, you know, struggling to get through a week. Are you trying to dance with me or what? Are you sure? <laughs> There's about 1,200 food hampers go out every week uh, into the local community, uh, and then 600 hot meals go out onto the streets as well. And all of those people, they're people who need it. You know, they're struggling. Thank you. No problem. Ian is 42 and single. He recently became unemployed. He's here for the first time. How does the food here compare to what you've been having lately? Probably better. It's better food. Really? Is it the best feed you've had all week? Probably, yeah. The first hot meal I've had for a while anyway, yeah. 
And uh, I've been just been eating from supermarket shelves and stuff, and it's uh, been not really good. Thank you. And, and Marty's organisation, they, they've put you up. You, you, you're staying with them at the moment? Yes. Yeah. Temporary accommodation? They're really nice people. Um, yeah, it seems, just seems to be going too well. And what do you hope is going to happen happen next? Uh, employment, sa- uh, stable. Hope I'll, I'll say I'd have stable uh, accommodation, stable employment, um, being able to bank my money again, pay off me. Ma- I had a Mastercard. I'm into that for thousand dollars. I've got to pay that back. And, uh, just hopefully everything's going to go real well. But you need a job mainly. Oh, I've need a job mainly, yes. <laughs> I've, got, I've got trade skills. I've got forklift driving skills. I've got um, process working skills. I've got cleaning skills. John's eating here tonight for the first time too. He's 23, also single and unemployed. <laughs> and at the moment you're on Newstart? Yes, I am. Yeah. And tell us about that. It's actually quite difficult to live. You do not have enough money to survive for a fortnight. Like, I'm on basic 500 a fortnight, and I've barely got enough to feed myself. I'm actually living off two-minute noodles at the moment, which sucks. And how does that compare with what you got here tonight? Tonight's dinner actually filled me up, and, yeah. (laughs) Is it the best meal you've had all week? It's the best meal I've actually had in about two weeks. (laughs) I'm left with maybe 50, 60 bucks at the end of the fortnight. For, for the whole two weeks? Yep. So how do, you, how do you stretch that out to feed yourself each day? I, maybe eight, I only eat one meal a day, so... And that's only dinner. Because that's all you can afford? Yeah. You feel a bit better with a full stomach? Yes. <laughs> I'm going to go home and go to sleep now, and up first thing in the morning to the housing office, and then... Straight on the road looking for work. I'm actually off to the city to go work tonight. And you getting paid? No, I'm actually doing it as a volunteer. Yeah. And t- tell us about that. I'm an event manager for a nightclub in the city. Um, I was doing event management before I went in for surgery seven weeks ago. And um, since I've come back, I lost my paid position, so I came back as a volunteer. And um, I'm in talks of contract at the moment. When dinner's over, the car park crowd waits for their number to be called to grab a free bag of groceries packed earlier in the day. Number 12, Lee. When someone new turns up, how does that make you feel? It's a mixed feeling, isn't it? Because you know they're here because they need help and you're sad that they need the help. Like, we're, we're the kind of... I think we're the kind of service you want to put out of business. You know, if people didn't need help, but they need help. And so it's good to be here and it's always good to be able to offer that help. So, yeah, it feels good. 29 years now. For Ian, it's been a night of surprises more pleasant than he's recently gotten used to. I've got plenty of, plenty of stuff. I've got, um, what, chocolate ice cream even. You weren't expecting that. I wasn't expecting chocolate ice cream. <laughs> I've even got chips and lollies. Dips. Better than you can afford at the moment. Oh, I love it. I can't afford it. I've got about nine dollars in the bank I can spend. <laughs> Other than that, I've got nothing at all. Okay, guys, I've got to go home. I'm late. <laughs> Thanks for that. See you later. Have a nice night. The sun's not quite yet up in the hills around the Victorian city of Geelong. 
Hi, it's just me. Helen Long is already dealing with clients as she readies yeah. her own boys for school. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, you organise? You're going to catch the bus? In 10 minutes. Yep. Can you tell Charles to hurry up? <laughs> Charlesy, you got to hurry up. We're going to catch the bus. Yeah, yeah. Helen's job is helping the long-term unemployed learn to work again through a state government-funded centre called Northern Futures. To ensure their clients stay on track, Helen or her colleagues even pick them up from home. Can I just get back to my, I mean, to my calendar? So back to the... Hi Trace, how are you going? Um, so are you able to pick up Michael? Do you remember his address? Now the other thing is, Jodie's just um, texted in and said that she's got an appointment at one o'clock at the um, um, drug and alcohol. Have a good day. Victoria's second largest city was once a thriving centre of Australian manufacturing. For decades, that sector has been in decline. Hundreds of jobs have just been lost at Target's Geelong headquarters, and the future of Shell's plant here is also in doubt. Ford's factory shuts down in 2016. Geelong's northern suburbs have some of the highest rates of unemployment in the country. Hey Bruce, how are you going? What happened in the 50s and beyond was manufacturing started to decline, so so did the jobs. We also had what's called the middle class flight. So as people had more resources, they bought outside the suburb, which left homes to be bought up for rentals. So in this area we have a high amount of rentals and a high amount of public housing. Morning. So of course what's happened is gradually we've got more and more and more unemployment. So we're up to 9 to 10 per cent in this area as opposed to the um, state average which I think is about 4.5 at the moment. <laughs> okay. This is the first transition. Yes, yes. So it's transitional. How great is that? Are funny. you excited? Yeah. Oh, yeah. How good is that? It's just amazing. Morning. Amy is one of Helen's clients. She's 37 and has a 15 year old daughter. She has been on New Start for the past four years. Uh, I met Amy probably 10 weeks ago. Amy came in as what I it always affects me with no hope. She was a person who uh, didn't trust anyone and had no reason to trust anyone and was really just... Uh, she made a comment which really affected me, which was, I'm just waiting um, for my daughter to grow up and then I don't see a future for me. So I think what she was saying there, which some people do is, um, at some stage I will give up on life because there is no future and I don't want to keep living it. So when you first came here, were you home... You were homeless then, weren't you? Yes. Yeah. So you'd been couch surfing? Um, for about a week and a half. Yeah. Um, and then I went to the Selvos. For ten days, Amy was homeless. At the lowest point, her only sanctuary was her car. Just under this tree here. Yeah. Oh. Right. So this is it. It's my home for the night. The night, so... How'd you feel that night? I was scared. It gets dark out here and, um... I pretty much, I felt worthless because if, you know, you get to the point where you haven't 
no one gives a crap about you. Um, full knowing full well that they do, but it's um, just at that point I was just angry and upset and just thought no one cared. So, but it's going to get better. So. Never ever going to be in this situation again, ever again. It was only one night. The other nights I'd just um, stay at the front of my friends' houses, or um, and it, w- it was only like for a week until I got the phone call off um, the Salvos and um, got told I could stay in one of their motel room or hotel rooms. Amy and her daughter Ashley have been living in emergency accommodation provided by the Salvation Army for the past 12 weeks. It's one room and a bathroom. This is where I'm living. Ashley's bed, my bed, and that's what I have to live with. It's not easy because I can't cook. I can't actually, I don't have a sink to um, wash my dishes in and uh, yeah, it's just, it's actually really hard because Ashley hasn't um, eaten properly in a while, so I need to get back to that. So. Yeah. And is it yeah. difficult, and are there other reasons it's difficult being here? Oh, the, there's so many dramas. Um, I want to try and, like, yeah, just the dramas. There's too much. Um, I just want a quiet life. Um, I don't like confrontation and stuff. Mm. It's hard. It's hard. And it's hard for everyone in here, so. But it's light at the end of the tunnel, so. You don't know how much you miss, like, an actual kitchen sink being in here. You realise how, actually, you have, um, with the toilet being in the same room that you're washing your dishes in, and you've got the clean dishes in there, and it's, um, not, not right. Tonight's dinner is leftovers from the cafe where Amy works part-time. For six hours' work, she earns $105 a week. That means a $30 cut from her new start payment. I want to get a better job, a better job that will be full-time so I can provide and not have to rely on welfare. And do you think people choose to be on welfare? Is that a choice that people... Some people do, yeah. Some people choose to do that. Um, whether it's the way they've been brought up in that environment, like of their parents being welfare. Um, <clears throat> but, yeah, people choose to. And why would you choose? I mean, is it a life... Do you, do you think there's enough, there's enough money to have a happy... No. Nah. A happy existence on? No, nah, not at all. Not at all. It's um, it's not worth it, really. It's not worth the worrying about whether you're going to get your bills paid or whether you know whether you can go out and buy stuff for your kids or whatever. It's not worth um, being on welfare at all. Mm. No. Said if I keep taking medicine, I'll figure it out Coralie is a 42 year old single mum. Oh, Coralie is a mum who came to us probably 12 weeks ago. Again, has been put on from a parenting payment to New Start, and her youngest son is eight, so she has a requirement to be working and she wants to work. 
She wants to be part of society. Um, but she comes, Coralie comes after losing her husband eight years ago with a lot of anxiety, a lot of health issues. With her son turning eight, Coralie was forced off a single parenting payment and onto New Start this year. Her income dropped by $60 a week. It also upended her already frail financial situation. The next week I was getting letters from the Housing Commission saying I hadn't paid my rent. I was getting from all the direct debits I get taking out of my um, pension, they were, I hadn't paid them. So everyone's demanding their money. I had two direct debits coming out from a loan company. So they put me in debt for my bank $80 that week. So for the next two months, I was, I was really still haven't caught up from January because every week, every time I got money in that bank, the bank would swallow it because they're taking back the fees that I didn't have the money there to replace in the first... Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. So the banks charge yeah. me for not having money there that, that Centrelink didn't put in. And yeah. other times so you just got in. caught in um, this whole cycle. Mm. And But did you end up with less money on Newstart or not? Yeah. Mm. On top of everything else, Coralie's days are crippled by anxiety. Very bad. Like this morning, I haven't... It took me about an hour to stop vomiting and dry reaching. And um, it makes everyone late. Someone will turn... Like, this morning I was at sick, and then tradesmen turn up, so that puts me back again. So then so my son's late for school, I'm late here for school, and it just puts everyone back. Unlike Amy... Coralie's living arrangements are stable. Over the last eight years, she has raised two kids on her own in this Housing Commission home. 17-year-old Kristen and 8-year-old George. We we'll have to put as um, a poor family lived in a small village. They had to work very hard to grow um, That's it, sand it out. And, uh, uh, enough rice to eat. Well, originally I, um, to, I fin stopped working so I could look after um, George's father. He had um, motor neuron disease. I wasn't supposed to be able to have any more children, supposedly, and then I got pregnant with George. And then after he died, I just wanted to be with George all the time because I was, I don't know, because I always felt guilty with him. Because I, when I, even when we were pregnant, we always knew that his father wasn't going to survive. It was a disease that there was no cure for. So it was always maybe the guilt that I, I knew. Oh, it was always I'm never going to be me. He could never do anything. When he was born, he couldn't even hold him. So I knew it was always only ever going to be me. So I, I resigned myself to it. And it was my responsibility. I wanted to... So I always said I wanted to have these children, so I'm the one that has to look after them and bring them up and stay at home with them and, yeah, not, not drink around them and, yeah, well, that's... So I didn't. It's you know, I sheltered them probably too much. <laughs> but then my daughter's still doing you 12, so I think I've done all right. <laughs> there. I usually just get paid on a Wednesday or a Thursday and by that night the next morning's gone. Because we have a, only on food and I'll fill the car up, we'll buy food and then I don't care what, if we haven't got anything else. I'll wait until Tuesday or Wednesday or something like that then. As long as we've got our petrol and our food, we don't care. Back at Northern Futures, Amy at last gets some welcome news. So have you told your daughter? Yeah. And? Um, we're going to go and have a look this afternoon at it. So she was all excited, dropping up and down and everything. So Torquay Road, how far? Um, it's out? right up the top. Um, you know where the vet is up the top of Torquay? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's just past that. It's in like a um, group of units. And that's for nine nine weeks? Yeah, nine oh, weeks. Yeah. It's another four, yeah. Yeah. Can't see in though. The Salvation Army has found them a temporary home, but not yet the keys. Exciting. It's 
looks pretty good. Better than where you are. A lot better than where we are. It's good, nice and be nice and quiet and yeah, be able to just have our time. So yeah, it's good. Be able to get into a routine and um, not have to worry whether I'm going to have somewhere to sleep at the end of the night so um, and close to schools too so um, with Ashley with school so good it's good no doubt if if Amy keeps going the way she's going um, we will have her employed next year and she will be independent, financially independent and able to, if she wants to, rent her own home. Mm. Over the last decade, economic growth in Western Australia has outstripped the rest of the nation. With the mining boom slowing, that trend may be in retreat. Half an hour north of Perth is the city of Joondalup. The rows of new buildings and new developments suggest that most here are still doing well. Less starkly visible are those who are not. Morning, Kyla. Morning, Mel. Morning. The Spear Centre, funded by state and federal governments, helps the people the mining boom has squeezed out or left behind. Rents in WA especially have increased even more than um, the rents throughout the rest of Australia thanks to the mining boom, um, amongst other things, and the rising cost of living. But it's private rent that people are struggling with the most, we're finding. Um, so if you could start by checking the messages, please. Tina Bennett is one of the centre's financial counsellors. We have had several clients that have been retrenched um, from mining jobs, um, but from jobs in particular, yes. Um, the, it's the older clients that have the trouble getting back into the workforce. Uh, there's definitely um, a rise in unemployment. Take a seat. Hi, Tina. Barbara's here to see you. OK, bye. She won't be long, Barbara. Hi Barbara, I'm Tina. Tina. How are you? Come through. You made yourself a coffee, that's yeah. great. Come in and have a seat. 52 year old Barbara has been unemployed for two months. A painful bone disorder means she can no longer work as a patient carer at a children's hospital. She's shifting from sickness benefits to Newstart, which is about the same amount. After covering her rent and utilities, she's left with just $45 a week. Do you have a home telephone? I have not, um, been unable to put the phone on due to not being able to cover the, even the rental and, and so forth. So. I just basically use my mobile, but I can't. I haven't even got credit on that because that's thirty dollars out of out of this mm. payment. So I've just got like a two dollar SIM card in, so that people can contact me. But you can't make outgoing calls. No, yeah. unless a fr through a friend or yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. And then you've got medications as well that you need to yeah. buy. Yeah. Yeah. And how much do they normally cost you? Uh, probably about um, forty dollars a month. That's with the with, 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 with PBS concessions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's without, without work, Barbara's options are bleak. She owes money on a lapsed phone contract, and, and the repayments on her car have fallen far behind. It's already worth much less than the amount she borrowed. Okay. Well, there's a copy of your income and expenditure or budget for you. Um, and as you can see, it's gone into the red, unfortunately. It's just, yep, not enough coming in at the moment. Um, so your biggest concern at the moment <clears throat> is probably the car loan? Yeah. Yeah. Simple things like toiletries are now luxuries Barbara can't afford. Tina's offering of $60 in supermarket gift cards 
brings unexpected relief. Oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just, because I've been struggling with, you know, personal items and, you know, for my daughter and, you know, a lot of it's been given to me by the family and, and just be able to go and buy it for ourselves is yeah. really nice and I really appreciate that. That's okay. just really, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. That's okay. Don't yeah. have to apologise. I can also get you some personal items on your way out yeah. as well to save you having to buy it from the card. Yeah, so I don't know how that's much really, got. really, you know, touching. And you know, I'm a, I know I've had help before, but that's just like, oh my god, I can actually go and buy, buy something, you know, yeah. um, for my daughter and you know, just. Simple things for her, you know? Yeah. So, that's, thank you so much. It's okay, you're welcome, Baza. Barbara's situation is indicative of um, a lot of the clients that we see. Everything's going okay, but it just takes one incident um, for it all to fall apart. A lot of people are basically just one paycheck away from financial hardship and it only takes something like sickness or unemployment, something unforeseen. Because clients are on low incomes to start with, they're not able to build up savings, they don't have the resilience to plan ahead. Sometimes even insurance is an extra cost that they're not able to afford. For the first time in a long time, for Barbara, going shopping has been a pleasant experience. Well, it's better than what I normally could get. <laughs> is that... I've got some really good specials as well, so that's what I looked for, yeah. And does that make a difference to how you're feeling at the moment? Of course, yeah, yeah. So... Um, you know, even things like yoga, you sort of don't get because you you tend to get the other butter or milk or the nece real necessity. So this is like a treat. <laughs> and how do you feel being in that situation when you've worked all your life? Uh, yeah, it's not a very nice feeling. Um, you know, and trying to bring up a teenage daughter as well, it has an impact on her. So. Yeah, I mean, you just have to accept it and the situation you're in and, and get on with it, yeah. And how do you hope things are going to change? Uh, well, obviously, I'm, I'm looking at, um, you know, entering back into the workforce. I'm studying at the moment to, uh, to be able to help me to get a job that can help me cover my costs quite comfortably. Um, yeah, so in the meantime, I just have to accept that this is the situation I'm in and do the best I can with what I've got and the help with, through the Spear Centre and places like that. If it wasn't for them, then I'd, I really, truly would be stuck. Um, I had a lot of support and help from my family and friends, and, and without them, I, I really don't know how I would have managed, so that's how I survive. And then I've got some toiletries for my daughter because normally I wouldn't be able to get it. Um, and I shouldn't have got it because that's that little bit of extra that I spent on which I should have maybe have got food. But just simple things like a decent deodorant for her, personal items and a little treat of a spray for her, which I haven't been able to get for ages. So I should be happy with that. Yeah, so there for her. And that was, I, the Spear Centre gave me a $60 voucher, which I was really taken with that. And the shopping today cost me $57. So what I've got is, yeah, I'm happy with that. I've got toilet paper, which sometimes is very hard when you haven't got the money. So what have you got left to, and to win? Uh, I've got the, from the voucher $3 and from my um, payment with Centrelink and the costs I have, I've got $44 left for the next two weeks to my next payment. 
How does life compare now with when you had a job? Well, it's for, for myself, like socially, it's pretty non, non-existent. Um, I just find that, you know, the simple things like even just going out for a cup of coffee, um, I have to decline. Um, so really, I just, yeah, I, I, I'm sort of stuck at, as to how to explain it because, um, you know, unless you're in that situation, um, you don't sort of... Um, understand what what people like myself are, are going through. Staff at the Spear Centre are braced for even greater demand on their services if the mining boom slows. I would say over the next six months we're going to see an increase in people facing evictions, um, pe families and people in financial hardship, being unable to afford to pay mortgages and loans and credit cards, trouble with utility bills. Sometimes that can be a first indicator that people are in financial hardship. They might try to maintain their payments to keep the roof over their head and it's the bills that come in occasionally such as um, electricity, water that um, and car regos that they have trouble with because they're not budgeting for them, they're just living day to day and sometimes there's not even enough for proper food to go on the table. Um. If you have those high rents and then you have the big paying jobs in decline, uh, are you a bit concerned about how that's all going to pan out? Very concerned, yes. I mean, we're in crisis mode at the moment um, at this centre and at other agencies trying to deal with the backlash of the rising costs unemployment um, and cost of housing, so I dread to think what it's going to be like in the near future. The last time we met Ian, he was practically homeless. Good day, Jeff. How are you? Going? Good to see you. Good to see you. Now, on the outskirts of Sydney on the Hawkesbury River, he's found a caravan he can afford. So, uh, it costs him $160 a week. I'm starting to go forward now. I've got a place to stay. I'm not on the street. Um, I'm not going bankrupt. <laughs> um, hmm. all, all around better. <laughs> I've got $36 and I've still got to do my washing. <laughs> That's going to keep me for another week. But I should be all right. Hmm. Ian still relies on food parcels from local charities. If there weren't organisations like that, mm. what would your situation be? Unpleasant. Very unpleasant. I'd be um, still camping in the bush. Um, just unpleasant. <laughs> Yeah. How do you spend your spend your days usually? Looking for work, cold canvassing, handing out resumes, applying for jobs on the internet, thinking of other job opportunities I can think of to investigate, um, all around job seeking. <laughs> I've been all around the industrial era. I've um, handed out between 20 and 30 resumes. Yeah, so, so hopefully, slowly, I'll be getting back on my feet. How'd it go? Good. Uh, not too bad. They said it was all, most of them said it was pretty quiet. There was uh, one guy there, he said, he, said he, he, didn't, he might be interested in a little while's time, but um, other than that, Nothing. <laughs> so what's next? Uh, probably up the street. Have a look up there or down here or... and uh, see how we go. Good luck. Thank you. John is still hoping volunteer work will lead to a full-time job. 
Amy's moved into her transitional home while training for more permanent employment. Coralie's just begun a voluntary placement in an aged care facility. Um, Barbara's crazy. looking into a disability pension while completing studies at TAFE. She hopes to secure a job in community services. Back in Western Sydney, there's another car park rush hour. This time, it's for breakfast. People come here to get a good brekkie, good wholesome brekkie in the mornings, kickstart their day, and a lot of homeless people as well. People who generally can't afford a home on Newstart or whatever, and they're actually sleeping rough on the streets. It is growing. Um, unfortunately, I always say to people, it'd be great to put ourselves out of a job. Uh, I, I don't see it happening soon, though, unfortunately. It's, it's getting worse. And why is that? People are under a lot of pressure, you know. Uh, cost of living goes up. I was talking to a lady this morning, she got an extra $13 in her pension, but a rent by, the next week a rent went up by $10. You know, like, people just can't seem to get a break. <laughs> you know what I mean? So uh, people are doing it tough. I think you get the idea. If anyone would like more information about the three organisations mentioned in tonight's program, Christ Mission Possible, Northern Futures and the Spears Centre, you'll find it on our website. Next week on Four Corners, Marion Wilkinson reports on one of the most tumultuous weeks in Australian political history. Until then, good night. <laughs>